Woo woo, welcome to Bible Theory, homie. Taking the church to the streets, homie. Welcome to Bible Theory Podcast. Thank you so much for uh, clicking this video. Uh, if you can, I challenge you, stay to the end because you want to stay to the end for this one. Microphone checker. Uh, pass the microphone back to Bruce real quick. And uh, Bruce, why don't you uh, introduce yourself real quick for those who don't know you, uh, for those who never heard of you, uh, you know, just tell us a little bit about who you are um, and what you do. Okay, well, I grew up in Central Florida, and uh, so most of my life was spent there. And then after I got out of high school and college, I taught at a Christian school there for a while, but always with that idea and knowledge that God wanted us to head into missions. And so I was always interested in missions since I was a kid, and uh, we always had uh, missionaries in our church, missionaries at camp. They were just uh, always a part of our lives. And so both my wife and I were able to take a couple mission trips just out of college and and have that opportunity. And then after getting a little bit more schooling, uh, we decided to go with a mission called ABWE. We're the Association of Baptists for World Evangelism. And uh, that took us down there to Nicaragua. When we visited Nicaragua, we really felt like that was the place for us. We had some uh, friends to work with down there. But then also we uh, were looking to have a ministry center that we would use for camping, for training pastors, for church retreats, for, for everything. And so uh, that really just drew us in to that area. I had visited down there with a friend of mine in Costa Rica and so had a little experience there. But uh, just when we we got to Nicaragua, we just kind of knew that was the place for us. And so God's uh, just really blessed us to be a part of a ministry there for now for over 16 years. And uh, it's just really been neat to see how the church is growing. Uh, we would say uh, we really think we're part of a church planting movement among churches there, Baptist churches specifically, uh, that just is really, it's really neat to be a part of that and to see that work advancing. And really, it's all to the glory of God because, you know, I went down with no Spanish, learned yeah. Spanish, and poco a poco, you know, it's learning a little bit at a time, you know, just getting the Spanish and then teaching in Spanish and and now uh, just being able to work with our national partners and see what they're doing uh, in the Lord's work is is amazing. Yeah, that sounds great, man. Um, you know, doing Spanish ministry, you know, is one of my, you know, things that I, I'm really attracted to. And I'm a second, you know, generation Hispanic myself. And I, I just have a huge heart for for Latin America and for Latinos and Hispanics in general. I think God is doing something with Latinos. I think there's a huge opportunity. And that's one of the, my goals, uh, you know, not only for this episode, but for like my entire show really is to highlight that, you know, yo, Latinos is where it's at, man. You got to come out here, man. The water is warm. You know, if you want a people group, obviously there's many people groups. But right now in America... There's a lot of Latinos that need to be reached with the gospel. So definitely yep. that's great that you're reaching them. I have no problems with the Baptist planting churches. You know what I mean? So <laughs> that's a different conversation. You know what I mean? So but I have no well, problem. You know what I mean? So, but obviously I have interviewed um, Alex Cockman before on his book, mm -hmm. on uh, book on missions. And so I, you know, I, I appreciate uh, everything with the Baptists do and what, what they're doing down there and, Hey, you're down there and I'm not. So uh, I'm, rooting, I'm rooting for you, I guess. You know what I mean? There, there you go. That's right. Yeah, we're heading the same direction on that one. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, it is exciting. Like you're saying, the next, I think the next wave in missions is coming out of Latin America. And so our goal is not just to go down there and plant churches, but to, to look at a church planting movement, turn into a missions movement. That's mm -hmm. our ultimate goal. And we really think that's the place that's going to happen is out of Latin America. Yeah, there's, there, you know, it's prime, it's ripe, it's... They never had mm -hmm. a reformation or the real gospel there before. So it's perfect. Mm -hmm. So with that, let's go on and talk about. All right, let's go ahead and learn about Nicaragua. Yeah, that's right. Nica, Nica, Nicaragua. So with that, let's go on and talk about Nicaragua. A lot of people yeah. don't even know where it is on the map. <laughs> by the way, you know, without Googling it, I dare you to try to find it. <laughs> okay. So it is in Central America. It's actually a large landmass. I think it's one of the largest Central American yes. countries. And is it has the you know the largest lake uh land ma lake mass in Central mm -hmm. America, I think. And it has tons of volcanoes, just like many Central yeah. American and it's part it has a lot of jungle, by the way. And uh mm -hmm. so definitely they still eat tortillas like Mexicans, so don't don't be hating <laughs> on them. You know what I mean? Um, anyways, uh so tell us a little bit about uh, La Gente de, de Nicaragua. Uh, Nicaragua really is a special place. You know, we really, 
are just impressed by how friendly people are, how open to the gospel they are. I mean, that's a big part of it, but also just the culture itself is a very friendly culture. And, you know, there's that reputation in the past of civil war and those kind of things, but the average Nicaraguan really is just, you know, people are there as work, hard workers and they're working to live day to day many times. And so it's a it's a tough life in Nicaragua. Like we talk about the volcanoes mean earthquakes and hurricanes and, you know, natural disasters all around us all the time. But Nicaraguans are very hardy people and very hard workers. And so, you know, it really is an exciting place to be. We haven't seen uh, a lot of the gang activity hasn't gotten so much as far south as we are. And so it's still a very safe place. At least, you know, from my perspective, I travel all over the country visiting pastors and being involved in ministries all around. So uh, we just really enjoy it. And it's it's exciting to see how the work is growing and growing and people are being saved and discipled and churches are being planted. So we look at it really as a harvest time. So it's exciting. You know, when I first went to Nicaragua, set probably like, nine years ago maybe <laughs> eight nine years ago you know the one of the first things that shocked me it's a culture shock for sure and one of the things that shocked me was the traffic and everybody just is you know what i mean <laughs> i'm like the like the planet where the jedi temple is and everybody's like you know? <laughs> yes it, it, that's the way i thought of it i was like man everybody's just going their own direction and i was like i never want to drive in this place so so um how was it to get you know adjusted uh what you call it the directions could be difficult it, it, you know unless, you grew up <laughs> in the south, unless you're from the south like alabama you know what i mean it's very right. similar directions from alabama from what i hear you know, just follow this way 10 yeah. kilometers until you hear the blue house and turn left to another 10 kilometers until you see the mountain with a tree. <laughs> so it's that like, is oh, about God. right. Yeah. <laughs> we had one. We still have the one where they don't they fue la Pepsi, where the Pepsi plant used to be. You, so you have yeah. to know 20 years ago, there's a Pepsi plant there or the arbolito, the little tree. One time yeah. we used a goat as directions. Just turn left when you get to the goat. So we have all sorts of fun stuff. But, the, you know, the first couple months is very stressful driving. But then after a while, you you just get used to it. You expect people to cut you off and you know that's going to happen. And we use our horns politely. You know, you're you're letting people know you're there. And it's it's really is uh, something you kind of get used to after a while. And then, as, as you know, most of the country is very rural. So once you get out of the city, you there's no traffic and you're just seeing a beautiful place. Uh, yeah. Nicaragua really is a beautiful country. and and uh but driving is is it's boring when you go back to the states because there's nothing pulling out in front of you there's no ox carts you know that kind of stuff so yeah, yeah. it is exciting uh, is it still is the, uh, last time i went there there was like a huge drought that's that's like mm -hmm. a buzzword i kept hearing oh a drought, oh, yeah. drought, drought has it rain has it rain um is this still like a drought going out there like a severe drought like you know not as green as it as it once was oh, perhaps? in fact this year was just the opposite we had more rain than we've had in years so we've rebounded from that this year but you know every year it could be uh we've had a number of hurricanes these past couple of years too so that's changed the weather a little bit but we normally you know the rain stops in november and doesn't rain again until may is just normal for us so it's kind of like you live six or seven months of drought and then you hit the rainy season. So it's either hot and dry or it's hot and wet. So no, it's hot and, those are it's two hot. seasons. Last time I went, it was hot. It was like, yes. I couldn't stop sweating. I took like three different showers a day. It was like, <laughs> oh man, it's crazy. So if you Number have showers per day, <laughs> three, yep. three showers for me, I, I, you know, and by the time I got out of the shower, I was sweating. I was like, oh man. Exactly. <laughs> okay, what's going on in Nicaragua's churches? Let's talk about the current state of the church in Nicaragua. I know we kind of alluded, you know, church planting, and you said you were going out to visit different church churches right. and visit pastors and stuff like that. But can you zoom out real quick and just give us maybe like a drive-through history of Christianity yeah. in Nicaragua? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we would say that the evangelical church has been growing rapidly over the past 20 years or so. Uh, when we first were getting ready to go to Nicaragua, we thought it was about 15%, and it's over well over 45% now uh, evangelical. And But you know, a big part of that is just that rapid growth of the Pentecostal church, and along with that, the rapid um, growth of the prosperity gospel. So there's some, some question there, are people turning to Christ or are they turning to promises 
of riches and health and things. So right. that leaves a, a situation where I would say churches are being planted rapidly. Good churches are being planted rapidly, but you're also seeing a lot of people that are <clears throat> turning into cultural evangelicals, just like they were cultural Catholics before. They just Catholic in name. Many of your evangelicals nowadays are the same, where they've just uh, kind of been to a church once, and so they're evangelical. So that's that's one of the things we're facing right now is that lack of discipleship mm -hmm. that happens. People just say, "Hey, I'm saved. I'm part of a church. I'm good." You know, now it's you say it's a fifty-fifty culture of Catholic and evangelical, but a vast majority of those people don't go to church on a regular basis. So uh, there still is a lot of work to be done. Still, a lot of places that don't have a good church in them. Uh, but backing that up is how do we get those churches to grow with people that really know Christ? And so, do you think the problem would be? Uh, I guess it would be a good problem, but it's still a problem. Uh, you think it'll just be a, a lack of uh, cate catechists, you know, instructors, and di disciple makers? Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, because you know, people come into churches and they're there's <clears throat> especially in situations where the prosperity gospel is common and are being discipled correctly. They're coming in looking for those promises, and when they don't have those realized, they're right back out the door. But mm -hmm. now the stamp is evangelical. You know, mm -hmm. they're not Catholic anymore, the evangelical, but they'll never be back to that church. <clears throat> so it's a lack of a real clear understanding of what the gospel means, and then a lack of follow-up follow and discipleship. Hmm? What kind of gospel you think they, they come from? How do they understand or assume the gospel when they walk into, you know, your guys' church for the first time? Like, yeah. well, what is the most common uh, theological things you have to overcome and disciple away? You know what I mean? Yeah, usually uh, they're coming from a Catholic background. And so when you walk in with that, you're coming in just thinking, what do I have to do to be saved? You know, what are the things I got to check off my list? What are the days I need to be here? <laughs> How much money do I need to pay? <laughs> oh, wow. So there's there's some of those things that are there. But, <clears throat> you know, when um when a Pentecostal comes into uh, one of our churches, one of the things they're going to be faced with is a real, do you really understand the gospel and what that means? And uh, have you really made a decision for Christ hmm. and not for the Santa Claus Christ? You know, just what not for what he offers, but for for Christ himself. Are you really in love with Christ? So, yeah, that's that's a good question, because that yeah. is what you see coming into the churches. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, now let's go ahead and back up. I, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of people, uh, a lot of uh, shots out to uh, Pastor Elder Aldo out there in um, Pinecrest, PCA. He's holding it down from the city of Miami and Pinecrest Homestead. So shots out. Go ahead and check him out on uh, youtube and uh pinecrest pca anyways uh talking about florida you know you lived in florida for a little bit right so let, let's yeah. back this up a little bit and talk about where all my people from lakeland the one of the most popular heretics of our time is uh todd bentley hashtag todd bentley if you don't know that go check it out because it's uh it's 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 a, it's a historical thing in terms of uh the you know, the church in the modern day and how heretical, how insightful that is for us in this conversation, I think, because it kind of relates. And it's kind of interesting mm -hmm. how you used to be in Florida, Lakeland, and mm -hmm. how Todd Bentley, Todd Bentley had his, you know, uh, quote unquote ministries out there in uh, Lakeland. So uh, real quick, can, can you discuss and, and just give us insights of um, how bad was the leadership at, at Lakeland and how those type of revivals and that type of theology made it, made its way, um, you know, one degree or another, uh, predominantly in my view, I think in Latin America, like you go to Mexico and you go to Central <clears throat> America, historically, you find a lot of revivalistic, uh, type ministries, uh, churches that are like copied and paste from mm -hmm. Todd Bentley, I think. And why why so many of them? Since you're from Florida, I thought, I thought you rep Florida real quick and just, <laughs> you know, <laughs> represent Lakeland from the proper yeah. sense. <laughs> well, I think you you really always have the cult of personality. <clears throat> and we find in our part of the world that people love a strong leader and they'll rally around that, that strong pastor. 
And Bentley to an extent was even, you know, bigger than that, bigger than life, uh, really rough around the edges. He drew in a, a group of people around him that really wanted that type of leadership. And that is exactly what we see out throughout our region. Churches that grow, sadly, are many times around a personality, someone who's a really strong leader. And I'll say this carefully, there's a big part of that that is the lack of Bible understanding. People don't dive into the Bible for themselves and know scripture for themselves. They like to be told what to do. And you'd say, isn't that opposite of who we are? But but there's a, a vast majority of people that just go to church, tell me what I need to do. I'll follow the leader. And that permeates our culture in Central America. <clears throat> Give me a strong leader and, and we're good to go. And so his style and that revivalism focuses around the excitement and the rough edges are glorified. And, uh, you know, even the, the language, coarse language is glorified. And, and those are ideals to be followed instead of things that we need to really think about in regard to our sanctification. <laughs> so right. that whole style is exportable to our region. People like to have that strong leader that's going to tell them what to do. That's crazy. Yeah, we got to be careful of worshiping personalities. We mm -hmm. all are uh, susceptible. So I say that word um, prone. Yeah, prone, <laughs> uh, yeah. Prone, yeah, prone to uh, to worship a personality. Everybody has mm -hmm. that potential, uh, but especially in this like um, you know very enthusiastic type uh, approach to Christianity. Uh, when it comes to you know revival, faith, healing type ministries, mm -hmm. they do stress. They do look up to a single person. Mm -hmm. uh, I think our standards, right? The Westminster and even the London Baptist, most of the standards, the Heidelberg, the Belgic, they would look to a plurality of elders yeah. um, in terms of church government mm -hmm. and and not a pastor-led uh, type um, governance of church. And I think that's one of the fallacies uh, of when you look at Lakeland, is that it, it like you said it's a personality so aka in ecclesiology terms <laughs> it's a pastor led uh pyramid mm -hmm. type thing and it's a one guy one man run the show and right. he's he's god's anointed so you how dare you know you better not go up to him because he's god's anointed so yeah so that is exactly what we see all around us is everyone proclaims himself a prophet and anything they say is the word of god even if it's sinful you know, we've seen those examples of the man who says, God told me to divorce my wife and marry my secretary. And you just are appalled by that. How is that possible? God, but the prophet does. And if you name yourself a prophet, you're, <laughs> you're in charge. So you can get away with murder. Oh, man. So what's up with the reformed faith down in Nicaragua? Uh, so how has the reformed faith, you know, according from you guys, right, the Baptist point of view, how has that been going on? You know, how has that been received in Nicaragua? What are the pushbacks, some of the challenges, some of the positives and negatives, I think, that you have seen? Yeah. Well, let me give a little context to that because of, we're in an interesting situation. We have what we call the Institute of Church Planters. And in that, we work with <clears throat> four different church associations. And so we have a mix of associations coming together. And we love that because um, that gives us a chance to help them plant churches. We don't put up our flag. We don't tell them this is our church. We say this is your church that you're planting. But that does mean that we work with a broad range of views. Some who look at Calvinistic as a dirty word and others that are right where we are in our theology of salvation. So uh, the goal in that is to bring those guys together and have those conversations on a regular basis. We talk about these things and we, we go over them and we, we plant those seeds sometimes for people. It is fun. Most anti-Calvinists constantly posting <laughs> Charles Spurgeon and, yeah. and Paul Washer, you know, things like that all the time. Right, right. And so it, it's making inroads over time. It's, it, it happens. And, and over time we talk about those things, but the other side of that is that, you know, the, the evangelical church, has been in Nicaragua for a little over a hundred years. And so the goal of us coming in is just to help plant more churches and give good Bible teaching. And part of that is training teachers. And so we love to train pastors and we want to train them to be good teachers because it's a lot of those pastors that teach in their own local seminaries. So right. it, we're, we're playing the long game. <laughs> 
you know, we're looking way down the road and saying that this is our goal and how are we going to get there? We're just going to go a little bit at a time, have the conversations, um, give out good literature, good books to study. And those things are laying that foundation. Is Reformation ever going to happen in Nicaragua? Specifically in the context of Nicaragua, what what needs to happen for, for a full-fledged cultural reformation? A big part of that is getting everybody on board with that same goal mm -hmm. of evangelism, planning churches, discipleship. <clears throat> you know, we have a good momentum going now in the churches that we work with. Mm -hmm. So that every time we get done with a group of guys, we get another group of 15 to 20 guys that want to plant churches. So there's momentum there, but right. that only represents maximum, what, maybe around 500 churches in the country. Okay. And so you've got a lot of other churches that need to jump on that and really get focused on celebrating Christ. Uh, you know, you have a whole Pentecostal movement that celebrates the works of the spirit and the emotionalism, but uh, they're missing out on focusing on Christ. And so to see <clears throat> just that spirit of evangelism and discipleship and good Bible teaching grasp all of the, ba the Baptist churches and Central American churches and the churches we work with and uh, really grasp that view of planting more and more churches. Uh, once we have a church in every neighborhood and every barrio, then we can say, hey, it's saturated. We've got enough churches to reach out to people, but that's a long, we've got a long way to go. What are the challenges of church planting in Central America? Let's find out. Okay. Uh, the first one I have really is it's common throughout Central America. Just talking with our other missionaries in other countries say the same thing. Resources are always going to be a challenge for us. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, our country had <clears throat> some civil unrest. We had COVID. And then we had three hurricanes, you know, so what does that do to the economy? What does it do to the crops? People are really suffering. And so then you say to them, hey, we want to plant another church. Let's pool our money to do that. Well, I have 10 Cordobas, you know, which is like 30 cents. Can we plant a church with 30 Cordobas? And that is that choke between do you go to the states and raise money for ministry? Or do you or do you say to Nicaraguans? the same God as in Nicaragua, let's exercise our faith and pray and ask God to provide for that. You know, so there's the easy, fast way is just going somewhere else and raising the money. The long game is saying, how do we teach Nicaraguan churches to be self-supporting and to get behind missions and to give and to trust God to do that? So mm -hmm. that's where resources are a challenge. That's, that's a biggie right there. I always recommend The Great Omission by Steve Saint was a great book that formed my thinking on that. You know, mm -hmm. uh, churches that were given everything don't keep, it's not precious to them. They're just waiting for another handout. And Nicaragua is used to getting handouts. Mm -hmm. And so we, we've trained people badly to be dependent upon the big brother up north for things when we really need to train people to you know, have faith and trust God. That's number one. Resources are a challenge. Yes. Because, you know, how does that, how do you send a church planter out to the middle of nowhere and it's going to cost him 20 bucks in bus fares to get all the way out there <clears throat> and he's going to get a dollar in the offering plate. Yeah. For the so, Cordoba. Yeah. He has 30, yeah. 36 Cordobas <laughs> yeah. Yeah. if he's on a good day yeah, after know. the harvest. So uh, the second one, is going to be education. Mm -hmm. And that is a long-term process of just raising pastors up to the next level, getting them to get a full college degree, some of them to get masters, and then to be able to say that's going to help everybody. Mm. But that's a long process because education is expensive. Yeah, And how do you pay for that? It's, it's difficult for us to guy, get guys from the campo into Managua because it's going to cost them 10 or $20 to get all the way into where we are for, for studies. So how can we uh, build up their education from a distance? That, that's a real challenge. It's hard to go deep into theology if people don't have the base for that. And the basic Bible Institute just barely gives that base. Yeah. So, you know, if we want to go to that next level, which really requires some thinking and logic, it's a long process to get guys to that level. Number three is what we were talking about the cultural evangelicalism that we face due to the prosperity gospel and the people, the revolving door of the church coming, looking for those promises and not getting them. You have a lot of people that say, I'm already a Christian. You visit their house. They say, I'm a Christian. I go to such and such church. I usually just ask, what's the pastor's name? 
And if they don't have a clue, then I know that <laughs> they don't really go to that church. Right. But, th- but that's that cultural evangel- uh, uh, evangelical that's all around us. Man, there's a Catholic saint in every town in Nicaragua. What's up with that? And then one last one, which is timely, is just yesterday in Nicaragua, they celebrated the Purisima, the Immaculate Conception of Mary. And so sure. that December holiday in Nicaragua is way bigger than Christmas. Yeah. And that gives you perspective. The Catholic side of things is heavy into Mary worship and uh, all of that, all that surrounds that. And it distracts people from knowing Christ. So uh, it's sad to see that, but most people celebrate the Purisima and forget Christmas. You know, it's it's a secondary holiday for them. But that's a uh, that's Crazy. telling. We're yeah, still Mary more than Christ. Every every town I went to, I visited at least like five towns, five major towns, maybe six. Every town I went to, it was like they had a saint in the front of the town, like Saint mm-hmm. Sebastian or something like that. Yep. And I was like, Saint Sebastian, what in the world? <laughs> I was like, why does he have arrows? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, is everybody like, does everybody, everybody have saints? They're like, oh yeah, every town has like a saint. Every town. That's oh, right. Like, interesting. That's okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, at least Ireland kept to one and that's St. Patrick. So like, <laughs> at least they figure it out. Let's just keep one, keep it easy. <laughs> well, you know, and that's the idea. If, if every town has its own saint, so every town has the holiday of that saint. So that way you can circulate holidays. And mm-hmm. okay, there's a side note to that. <clears throat> if you're the priest in that area, then you circulate through the towns, picking up offerings on those days too, right? Wow. You don't want them all in one day. You got to make your way around from holiday to holiday. Sounds like a malapoli. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, speaking about priests, Catholic priests in Nicaragua, the first argument I ever had with the real Catholic, I think. It was definitely a, a Catholic priest in Nicaragua, and it was the one in Acuyapa. And you know, what bothered me was that there was a you know a homeless guy, you know, sitting in the front porch asking for money. And I was like, and then I find you know a little bit later, I went to the to the priest, you know, because you know we were all chilling, and I guess my father in law there knows the Catholic priest, and he was chilling at his house, and we were all just you know conversating. I'm like, do you know? I told my father-in-law, I was like, do you know there's a homeless guy right in front of your door just chilling? And he's like, oh, yeah, he always comes, you know, asking for money. And I'm like, oh, okay. So um, are you going to give him money or what? He's like, oh, yeah, I'll give him a dollar or so here in a little bit. And I'm like, okay, well, why does he need a dollar? Like what, you know, what's his situation? And he's like, oh, he buys uh, he buys shoe glue and he gets high on shoe glue. And I'm like, Really? <laughs> I'm like, wow, like, okay, um, that's the first. And then he's like, <laughs> you know, and I told the priest, like, aren't you going to do anything about that? And he's like, there's nothing I could do, like, you know. And I was like, well, yeah, you, don't you have the gospel? Like, isn't the gospel powerful enough? You know, and I opened the door for him, and we just, you know, we went at it. And it was, <laughs> um, yo, hold up. Let's get a Nicaraguan politic update real quick for you. You know, how political are the Catholic priests, you think, in, in Nicaragua? Do you think the Catholic priests are oh. still politically in, in, in bed with the state somehow? Is that still in existence or is it just the state? Oh, yeah, not so much right now. Uh, mm. That and some of the civil unrest that happened, that <clears throat> they ran afoul of the government. And so our government at this point, I would say, is more pro-evangelical. It's an yeah, it's an interesting switch in things. That balance has shifted, and so our evangelical churches uh, enjoy total freedom to do yeah. our ministries, and it really has changed a lot. But whoa, yeah, you hit an interesting point there. <clears throat> wow, so, yeah, they're struggling right now. But the other side of that is the Catholic Church has adopted evangelical practices and music, and you know evangelism methods they're going door to door they're trying to recuperate their followers because they've lost so many in nicaragua so they're on their heels you gotta get them bro right now you gotta get them you gotta get them and you gotta finish you gotta you you gotta be like muhammad ali and uh what's his name (laughs) frazier you gotta keep going (laughs) finish the fight yeah you gotta finish the fight so uh politically Let's go ahead and rewind and learn about the political history real quick. What what's like if you could just keep it vague for us? What's the what's the a political landscape historically in Nicaragua? Because a lot of my listeners are like between you know twenty four and thirty four. They may remember, 
Like, is it just Democrats down there, Republicans? Is it like yeah. uh, Joe Biden so, down there? What's going on? <laughs> we They had a civil war back in the 80s. So when I, I was in high school, when I remember <clears throat> that uh, they were having a civil war, well, nowadays, the pastors I work with, many of them fought in that civil war. Oh, and a lot of them, if they were too young, uh, they would have had to have been, you know, 13 or 14 to be too young to fight. But even at 16, 15, 16, they were being carried off into that war. So wow. it was just a brutal conflict that had deep, deep effects on the country, divided the country. But the winner of that civil war was the Sandinista Party, which was supported by Cuba and, uh, and Russia at that time. And mm -hmm. so obviously the United States was not a fan of that. You know, they, right. they, uh, they kicked out the dictator whose name was Somoza. And the Sandinistas came in and then the United States backed the Contras against them and just civil war for years. <clears throat> when that finally, finally settled down, you had democratically elected presidents come in, but just struggling for years to recuperate. And that really was a very tough time, but, but things just continually were progressing and getting better and getting better and getting better. We have now had the same president um, for the past 16 years. Uh, Daniela Ortega has been the president since the day I got to the country, <laughs> all the way up until today. And so wow. uh, he is the Sandinista leader, Sandinista party, wow. and um, has been our president for that whole time. So during that, that does mean there's been that stability and that ability for us as evangelicals to just continue working and planting churches, training pastors, mm -hmm. camps and retreats, all those things we've been able to do freely during that time. So we are thankful for that stability that happens, you know. Sure. When we, you know, when we said earlier that people like a strong leader, he is, he has fit that bill and people yeah. have been, uh, a good number of people have been okay with that and it has provided the stability in some sense to the country so i i could point them to uh you know the the caesars of rome it, almost every single caesar of rome had a, a, a stability factor uh, a mm -hmm. macho factor a personality factor and mm -hmm. you know as tyrannical and crazy as some of them were they brought stability they brought money they brought jobs they brought you know a safe haven made made the the people of rome feel safe mm -hmm. but you know every once in a while they killed christians and they persecuted the church and they done this stuff so <laughs> i'm just letting people know you know so sometimes that stability uh comes with uh with the backbite sometimes you know mm -hmm. i travel all over the place and feel safe in doing that and uh have a good relationship <clears throat> when we go into different areas we have a good relationship uh, just the other day i had a chance to witness to the police out on the eastern coast and you know be able to have those opportunities is also something that we can do in nicaragua we still go door to door in evangelism and do those kind of things with with even with teams coming in so there really are a lot of freedoms that we are allowed there so we're thankful for for what we do have yeah now is the is the country still building the canal is that still going or no it appears to be stalled <laughs> A lot of those big projects uh, that were going to happen have gotten stalled. Well, I mean, through COVID and everything affected the economies of everybody and really yeah. hit us hard. Yeah. All right. All right. It's about the closing time. All things have to come to a close. Um, if you have not already, please go ahead and subscribe and hit the little bell for notifications. I appreciate you. <laughs> all right. Um, and if you have made it this far, you made it more than 3%. So congratulations. <laughs> All right. Closing thoughts. What are some applications you want to bring back to the table for this conversation? People might be thinking like, oh, that's great information, but what can I do with this? Right. So in application, how can people walk away and do something, um, live differently? How can Nicaragua Christianity growth in Nicaragua, the church is favored from the government, from a tyrannical government? I think it's a win. I, 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 I see that as a win. I see that as Christ's uh, victory over, over a tyrannical government. I see that as a win. So wh what are some um, closing thoughts you have on this as well uh, that you want to reemphasize and you want you don't want people to become distracted in? Well, you know, I set my alarm for 938 on my phone <clears throat> to remind me that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. 
and that we need to pray the Lord, the harvest that he'd send out labors. You know, we look at Nicaragua as a harvest country right now, and we have space for hundreds more missionaries to come and help us in this work. And we would love to have your people pray for the work in Nicaragua that God would send laborers. And even out of Nicaragua, send laborers into those countries that are close to North Americans like Cuba and Venezuela and Russia. Maybe he could use Nicaraguans to do that. Maybe he could use some of your own listeners to do that. But will you pray for that? You can hear about, wow, that's exciting. There's a church planning movement. But are you willing to pray for that and pray for more laborers to be a part of that? That's a huge part of what we do is ask people to pray that God would send more laborers into the work. Hold up, hold up, hold up. How do you become a missionary, by the way? What's your advice? Okay, so if somebody wanted to become a missionary right now, what are the, I don't know, five steps, five <laughs> easy steps they could do it? Hey, number one is you need to talk to your pastor. You know, your church, in my opinion, should be your sending church that sends you to the mission field. And your pastors, your elders, your deacons, or whoever you have in charge of your program should know that you're interested in that. And then you're going to be studying the scriptures. If you need to get a formal classes to do that or find a way within your church to have those that Bible training, you need to get to know your Bible and understand it. And then start thinking about an agency or a group that would help you. You know, if you're in the PCA and you're going to the MTW, you're going to find people there that can help you walk through those steps of getting to the mission field. And I'm, in my case, I'm at abwe.org. <laughs> if you're interested as a Reformed Baptist, you want to jump on board. Uh, we have ways to do that as well. And we have people that will walk you through that. But, you know, it all starts with the local church mm. and your local leaders will be able to counsel you and say, hey, you know, you need to move forward on this. We'll help you do that because they need to send you out and be the ones that are behind you because they're really the ones holding the rope. So start there. Any last thoughts before we go? Hey, I'm just thankful for the opportunity to talk a little bit about Nicaragua. God's doing great things. And Amen. I think uh, it's fun to be a part of that. We'd love to invite others to be a part of that too. Hopefully uh, God will change the country in our lifetime and your lifetime too. That'd be great. And then if that happens, trust me, I'll bring you back and we'll talk about the victories. So then we'll <laughs> pop a bottle of champagne. <laughs> we'll do that. We'll do that. We'll do that. All right. Well, thank you so much for thank checking you. out my theory. Don't forget to hit the bell for notifications. Don't forget to subscribe as well. Follow me on Twitter at the Chicano Knox. Uh, Bruce, where can they find you uh, if they want to get in touch with you or they want to hit you up or anything like that? Right. You can actually find us through abw.org and look for Bruce and Laura Edgar. Uh, but we also have Facebook, Bruce and uh, what are we, Edgars in Nicaragua. If you're interested in, in that, that's a way to look us up. <clears throat> and, and see what's happening real time. We post new stuff all the time and whatever events are happening. Edgar's in Nicaragua on Facebook. That's for the old awesome. folks, you know. <laughs> old school. <laughs> all right, it links I'm into sure. Insta, so it, you can see it on Instagram too. Insta. All right. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> for the uh, old folks. <laughs> all right. Well, shouts out to all the faithful uh, elders, pastors, and deacons who are holding it down, keeping their head down, preaching the word, day in, day out, especially, uh, you know, when it comes to the Lord's Day, holding it down. So I appreciate you guys. Keep it going. And remember, go out there and honor Christ and seek his kingdom first. And all these other little things will come to you later. God bless you guys. Thank you for listening to Bible Theory. Bible Theory. Don't forget to share this with your homies. Support Bible Theory on Patreon. Follow me on Twitter at The Chicano Knox. Like and subscribe to Bible Theory on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcast, iHeartRadio, and more. Gracias por escuchar Bible Theory. No olvides a compartir esto con tus homies. Apoya Bible Theory and Patreon. Sígame en Twitter and The Chicano Knox. Dame un like y suscríbete a Bible Theory and Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcast, iHeartRadio y más. Y más.